This presentation is provided for information purposes only. Users of this information are doing so at their own risk. Fortis Alberta does not endorse the services or products of any specific consultant or contractor referenced in this presentation. Fortis Alberta will not be held liable for any loss or damage in connection with the use of these consultants or contractors or any information provided in this presentation. Hello everyone. Thank you for joining us today. As the host of this webinar, Fortis Alberta would like to acknowledge that its operations and facilities occur on the traditional territories, meeting grounds, and traveling routes of the Indigenous peoples of Treaty 6, 7, and 8, and Métis people in Alberta. Fortis Alberta makes this acknowledgement as an act of reconciliation and gratitude to those whose territory we reside on and are visiting. My name is Jennifer Schillam, and I am with Fortis Alberta, and I will be facilitating today's session. No pressure. Uh, and Fortis Alberta is pleased to be co-hosting this with Connect Mobility, uh, Cambian Networks, and special guest Carolyn McCauley and Yvette April. Some housekeeping items before we begin. The session is being recorded and a link will be provided in the days following the event. As you may have noticed, attendees, microphones, and cameras have been disabled. When the Q&A begins at the end of our information session, they will be unlocked should you wish to ask a question and let the panel see your smiling face. For any questions that are during the Q&A, we'll ask that you do raise your hand. But if anything hits you midway through the presentation, the Q&A is open and available for questions at any point in time. It will be moderated, though, so do not be concerned if your question does not immediately show up. So today's webinar, as I've said, wireless <laughs> broadband, I'm hoping everyone is in the right meeting and not looking for its uh, sister delivery method, fiber. Uh, with wireless services improving dramatically over the last few years, the panel will be speaking to wireless's direct benefits. As you know, wireless is now capable of delivering data speeds far as fast as fiber has dramatically reduced installation times because facilities are installed on existing infrastructure, such as distribution poles. And by cutting out the extensive underground work required for fiber, the wireless approach is typically 20% of a fiber solution. Today's panel is going to speak to you about the importance of broadband in supporting rural communities and the opportunity it can make on economic development and rural stability. Provide an overview of Cambium's wireless mesh network, which takes cost effective and rapidly deployable municipal broadband possible. Cover Fortis Alberta's process to attach wireless devices on Fortis Alberta poles, as well as the cost and fees to attach. And discuss the UBF funds, how Connect Mobility fits in the mix, and we'll get some sentiments from a CAO on their implementation experience. Once your brain is flooded with this absolutely wonderful information, we will have that Q&A session. Now that we know how today is going to flow, I would like to bring our first speaker on board, Caroline McCauley. Caroline is a former councillor and mayor for the town of Vermilion, where she has championed economic development and revitalization in the community. She has a background in health services and an MBA in community economic development and has been an active member of the community for over 35 years, where she continues to promote the importance of rural stability. Caroline, your show. Thank you very much, uh, Jennifer, and welcome everyone to this informative, hopefully, um, in, um, session on broadband. Um, a little bit about me, you've heard that I was formerly the mayor. I'm very uh, passionate about rural sustainability, and it's really what brought me to that in terms of uh, working in my municipality. All right, so we are all familiar with our current municipal challenges. Um, certainly, we're facing a time of reduced funding um, in terms of supports from the provincial and federal governments. Uh, many of us have infrastructure deficits, and we've been responsible for the water, the sewer, the roads, the street lighting, those types of things in our community. Um, we've certainly seen a, a migration of our residents, our youth, from our rural communities to urban. And so really, uh, this is becoming a concerning um, factor in our communities as, as we need that youth to continue to build and um, keep our, our communities vibrant and strong. Um, we're experiencing workforce retention challenges. Uh, certainly in Vermilion, one of the things that was highlighted for me is we had a young 
uh, entrepreneur who developed a software that um, translated Japanese into English and vice versa. And when he came home to visit his parents, he could not even operate his business. And this really became a noticeable concern for us as a municipality as to how can we bring our um, youth and retain our youth in our community. We know that we're moving from more of that industrial to that data um, type of economy. So how do, we, how do we compete in a data economy? And then there's certainly those global trends impacting our rural communities. So it is that, that need for that data and how we can be part um, players in that economy. So why, why broadband? Um, this was a conversation we had um, in our municipality, certainly. And first of all, was just trying to get an understanding of what is broadband. Most of our residents felt there wasn't really much of an issue. They were able to um, get their Netflix and watch their movies um, and things were fine until we had to start doing uh, things online. And then we started to see some of the challenges. So broadband is that ability to connect with the outside world. And it's not just the ability to have that internet come to my house or provide me services, but it's also things that I want to send out. So we call that the upload and the download. Um, the federal government has established a 5010 uh, baseline standard. I'm going to tell you um, 10 upload, you're going to struggle to post pictures on Instagram with just something that many businesses are doing. You're going to have challenges um, having businesses with their debit machines, being able to send that information out. Um, so this started to become really a business problem, especially for our, um, our business sector and our community. We had a few businesses that actually migrated from the, the county into our community because our bread bun was actually better than what they could receive in the county, and yet it still wasn't meeting the needs of our business sector. So this is really about enabling our community to have commerce interactions and even uh, community interactions with other communities and the world and really looking at rural sustainability. How can I keep my businesses in my community? How do I keep my residents in my community? How can we be competing against global economies and even just the, just the economies down the road? And then we certainly had the whole role of COVID and people wanting to work from home. Um, so when you have your children working from home, they're trying to uh, receive information from school, then you had uh, potentially your partner or yourself being now working from home and the struggles of just having adequate broadband. So I think we've really become aware around how important broadband's become as a critical infrastructure in our community, as critical as water, sewer, electricity, power, all of those things. So the Vermilion story, a little bit about us. We started contemplating this um, just before the 2017 uh, election. Um, and then um, after that point, we started making this was part of our um, strategic plan. So in 2017, 18, as we were working on a strategic plan, um, we started talking about how could we make our community connected. We certainly looked at fiber. Um, and knew that that was far too costly. We had quotes of over $11 million. My community is a population of around 4,000. And we also have a shadow population of around 1,000 students with Lakeland College. So that gives us about uh, 5,000 population. And then the surrounding, we are a retail and commerce hub for our surrounding communities. Um, we had a mix of TELUS and Shaw at the time. And very interesting, sometimes TELUS and Shaw would overlap in certain parts of our community. And then we'd have other sectors of our community. For example, we had developed an industrial park that had no broadband whatsoever. So when I had a um, dealership move out there, a car dealership move out there, he was like, Carolyn, I, I, I don't have any broadband service here. And in recognizing that that service is very reliant on being able to connect it with other dealerships, around parts, around vehicles, all kinds of things. 
Um, and so we struggled to, to help him find a solution to this. And so finally, as we were moving forward and really wanting to build up that industrial sector in our community, we decided we needed to do something. Um, we had approached TELUS, and at that time they wanted uh, over $11 million, which of course we didn't have, and certainly were in no position to support that. And uh, we, really, we really wanted to find then, okay, what can be the solution? And we did reach out to, to Merle, so he will be speaking later on in this conversation. And we went to find a wireless solution because we, we knew we would start losing businesses. I actually, when, when we started having moving forward on broadband, I would get calls from businesses who were just outside of Lloydminster, but residing in the county, asking me as a mayor, how would I, could I bring broadband to them? So they saw the need and were even considering how do they move? Cause they, they could see, they couldn't maintain the business sector that they had in their industrial park. So how did we make this happen? We, um, our RITA um, did a, a broadband report. We started looking at our current infrastructure that we had. We hosted a digital futures conference. I don't know if any of you have had the opportunity to attend, but that's very valuable. We actually had a businessman speak at that conference and he spoke about things like he had four security cameras at any one time. He can only see two of them working because there wasn't enough uh, data broadband width. Um, he provided training to his staff. He would have to send them home because there wasn't enough broadband width in his office to be able to uh, do all the functions that they needed. So just very practical problems that he had as a business trying to work in our community. Then we started talking about it as a region, talked with the communities around us and started to have agreement that potentially we could look at this as a regional uh, project, but we would start with a pilot in Vermilion. So that's when we uh, moved forward with a pilot in Vermilion. And we, again, considered wireless, considered fiber and felt wireless was the most effective way for us to bring an immediate solution to those businesses that were struggling today, rather than trying to find a solution down the road. Um, we certainly um, had lots of challenges getting there. We weren't eligible at that time for the UBF fund. Um, we were considering using franchise uh, fee type of agreement to see if we could generate some uh, possible additional revenue for our community. So it is something else to consider as you look at some broadband opportunities, there may be some opportunities for a small amount of revenue generation for your municipality. And certainly all of us are looking for that. And um, that we uh, ran a test at our Vermilion Fair. We have uh, 24 people, thousand people, sorry, 24,000 people come through our gates in three days. So certainly far more than our, the residents in our community, but we really wanted to max test the project to see if it could handle a heavy load. And, uh, and then we had to, we at that time had to find ways of um, getting poles in our community because we didn't have the support of the electrical producer that we have in our community. So again, it's great to see that Fortis is, is in this conversation to support that. All right, that's a very long story. Um, so what are the opportunities? I've talked about a few of these. You have the ability to attract and retain talent for your municipality. So if you want to bring in that bright shining star CAO or CFO into your community, if you want professionals like accountants and oil field services, then we need to have um, that ability to, for them to connect. And one of the cool things that actually happened with this project is we were able to identify someone in our community who actually um, uh, upskilled and developed the skill to be our, our internet person in our community. So did a lot of the hookups, did a lot of the troubleshooting um, with our residents and our businesses. And as a result, developed that expertise and we were able to provide much faster response times than you ever see with um, the other uh, providers. It's a great way to engage citizens. Many citizens are on 
um, their phones, on um, their uh, iPads. And so you can send out surveys to them. You can send out newsletters to them. Um, we even have an app where we send push notifications. So there's a water main break here or snow shoveling's happening on this day. So you can engage your citizens. You can drive economic growth and innovation. Again, looking at the opportunities around smart cities, those types of things. Potentially, it's an opportunity to re re increase revenue just through franchise fees, if that's something you can work out or looking at some kind of a revenue stream. But then just the very fact that you can bring businesses into your community is already a way of increasing your tax revenue. And it's an opportunity to revitalize your community. So we saw actually during the downturn in the economy in 2018 to 2020, we saw a revitalization of our downtown as we started bringing more um, service delivery to our business sector. Um, they felt uh, valued and appreciated. We started to see an upsurge in, um, in uh, entrepreneurs in our community. Um, and then just the efficiencies that you can get from uh, being a smart city around billing, those kinds of things. We even looked at opportunities to dim our street lights in the evening somewhat and have them more motion centered. So we went to green technology on our street lights to reduce costs in the evening around electricity. So there's all kinds of innovative things you can do once you become um, more hooked up into broadband. Uh, one other thing too is just health access and safety access for your residents, for them to be able to. And we've all seen now too, people communicating much faster about strange vehicles driving through your community or things that are happening and getting the word out much quicker. So what's in it for business? Well, I, we've talked again a little bit around the retail transactions and the online presence. So during COVID, we uh, hosted a huge Best Vermilion online festival. We trained and supported our business sector on how to do um, little spots in their stores and advocate, uh, just to advertise their the products and services that they were offering. And uh, it was a huge success. Actually, our community won a provincial and a national economic development award for that. So, and that was really became possible because of some of the broadband pieces we were able to bring in. Uh, retail transactions, again, that debit machine doesn't work if there's not a good connection. Uh, of providing online access to training. So for those uh, industries that need to access training for their workers, um, it was enable, an ability for them to do that. That whole security infrastructure. So I spoke a little bit about the role of the broadband in, in terms of having those cameras working and be able to transmit that information back so that they can see at all times what's happening in their, in their uh, businesses. Uh, industry support around collaboration, working together with other sectors. So if you have, for example, a nutrient office in your, in your community or a Husky service, uh, they can communicate with the head offices, they can do payroll. So we had our sea cleaning pot um, she said she would, she would go in early in the morning to turn on the computer, to try to get it uploaded, to try to get the payroll off. And this increase, like she was able to do it in 10 minutes, uh, which normally would take her hours of time. So just thinking of that. And I think then we have to think a little bit about the future, um, looking at where agriculture is going with artificial intelligence. So think about robots and think about um, drones Think about um, artificial intelligence driving tractors. Uh, currently in Vermilion, we have a robotic barn at our Lakeland College. And that robotic barn tracks all the animals um, when they're eating, when they've been milked. They even uh, do sensitivity training of, of the milk to find out that the animal is getting an infection and can treat the animal before the animal even shows signs and symptoms of being sick. So I think we're going to see dramatic improvements and expectation then around the need to be connected so that we can um, you know, really move into that future economy. And then lastly, for your residents, and I, I have to say, this was probably one of the hardest areas to talk to residents about why was this important to them. COVID certainly helped this discussion, 
but um, I still have residents who are wondering why we need to do this and do we, do we really need this much? And I think we're going to see just a greater reliance on this. I'm thinking about, uh, I have a daughter who lives in Sturgeon County. Um, her light bulbs are all now smart technology. Her door, her garage door, she can tell uh, you know, when she's in, uh, in the city, if she's left her garage door open, for example. So that is gonna become, that working and learning from home is gonna become more important. Connecting with family. So we've all certainly had um, Zoom calls and, and stuff where people were frozen and not being able to, or the, the connection broke. So having that connection is gonna become uh, very important. Just enhancing the quality of life. Uh, so promoting our community as a better place. If you wanna get away from the hustle and bustle, come live in your rural community and um, you can have a lower cost of living from a housing perspective, all of that. Um, and just uh, being able to talk about that enhanced quality of life. I will give another anecdote that there are two communities in Alberta that are, are both towns. They are about that 5,000, 6,000 mark. They are about uh, 20 miles apart, so fairly close. One has, um, has internet access and the other one has very spotty access. The houses in the first community are worth $15,000 more than the houses in the second community. And uh, when I was speaking to a major telecom, they attributed that to the fact that they had broadband connectivity. So even that from a resident perspective, understanding that your house may be, have greater value is also an important thing. And then just the ability to run your own business and be connected to the world economy. So I'm very excited that you've um, come to this interest in service today to little, learn a little bit more about broadband. And I hope you, my story has helped you think a little bit about what your story could be, how this could actually support and improve economic development and just the quality of life in your community and really look towards that rural sustainability. So I'm very excited to see uh, where this will take many of you after you hear the other members of this um, presentation. And, and really think about, you know, there is no one solution. So uh, this is a great opportunity for you to move broadband quite swiftly into your community without a major cost and delay. And it is one, one opportunity. So, so uh, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Caroline, for that. I can say firsthand as a resident of a smaller community, um, it's always when you have things like this happening um, and all of a sudden your face is frozen on the screen in the worst possible face that you could possibly make. Well, you know, your, your executive or, or someone's on the call, a customer, and you're, and you're making that face because you've frozen up. So um, it's definitely a consideration for people moving out of those major urban settings now. Um, great. Well, now joining us uh, is going to be John Seaman from Cambian Networks. Uh, Cambian is a leading global provider of wireless infrastructure for business, government, residential broadband, and private public Wi-Fi. Cambian collaborates with network operators in education, healthcare, healthcare, industrial, campuses, municipalities, with a mandate to empower partners to economically maximize their broadband and Wi-Fi performance. So, John, take it away. Thank you so much for that. Um, and uh, thanks to Caroline for emphasizing so many of the great points about the importance of broadband for communities. Thanks also to everybody at Fortis and everybody that put this together. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to showcase the exciting new technology, which is making cost-effective and rapidly deployable broadband uh, a reality for communities. Uh, I want to emphasize some of the really important points uh, made by Caroline, and she covered it really well, and I've got some of the same kind of uh, information in, in my portion, which is the fact that demand for broadband is growing. Uh, it's showing no sign of slowing down. And in fact, the typical household broadband consumption is rapidly approaching a terabyte 
uh, monthly by 2025. And to put that in perspective, a terabyte is something like 700,000 floppy disks. For those of you old enough to remember what a floppy disk is, it's like 250,000 photos. It's also equal to 1,300 physical filing cabinets of paper. Um, so there's all this demand for for data. It's largely driven by video, but it, like Caroline mentioned, it's not all about entertainment purposes like streaming services like Netflix, but also remote meetings like this one, classroom instruction, other enhanced services. Homes and businesses are more connected than ever with smart home devices and security cameras. And also like Caroline mentioned, COVID was a game changer, especially in terms of remote workers. Uh, the reality is that many remote workers can literally now live anywhere. And it's a great opportunity for young people to get out of the cities and move home to their rural hometowns. And uh, this is something I've witnessed lately with a lot of my younger friends, my family members, my adult children. They're in this really enviable position where they can literally live anywhere and as long but that only works if there's good internet so for sure many of them will be interested in moving back to or staying in their hometowns having that high speed reliable internet is super important and it's important to the community as well because it boosts the overall economy the property values and quality of life so there's really two big challenges for underserved communities, which come down to cost and time. So sure, fiber to the home network is great, um, but it's simply out of reach without massive subsidies and grants. And the other big challenge is time, right? You want to deploy broadband quickly. Uh, and fortunately today for the first time ever, really there is a solution. And that is to build a wireless, mesh network utilizing power distribution poles and other locations for mesh nodes. And the wireless technology that makes this possible is named CN Wave, uh, whereas CN stands for Cambium Networks, and that's the company that I work for. So what is CN Wave and why is it so exciting? So CN Wave is a new wireless technology. It's not brand new, it's been out a couple of years. It uses specially designed compact radio devices. They get installed on power poles and buildings to create a mesh network, connecting all the nodes together. And we call this a distributed mesh network because nodes have multiple paths to the internet. And this provides redundancy and network reliability. And the really exciting thing about CN Wave is that it delivers the same speeds as traditional fiber to the home. In fact, when we compare fiber to CN Wave, they are functionally equivalent in terms of broadband speeds, and the service provides symmetrical upload and download, much like a fiber network. And the network can be designed with multiple connections into the fiber backbone. CN Wave devices consist of distribution nodes and client nodes, and the DNs are the distribution nodes are DNs, client nodes are CNs, and the DNs are designed to be attached to power poles or other types of, of uh, poles or, or buildings. And power poles are really ideal because they have nice height above street level, they're close to one another, and they all have a source of power. Uh, the client nodes are smaller, about the size of a smartphone, and they get installed in homes and businesses. And the mesh design concept is different from traditional fixed wireless, where all the subscriber radios are connected back to a central tower. In a CN wave network, the home CNs connect to the closest DN, which is mounted on a nearby pole. So CN wave delivers fiber-like speeds. It's also very reliable because of resilient mesh topology. But the biggest advantage of CN Wave Wireless is the low cost and much faster deployment time. And the reality is that a full fiber to the home network is in most cases prohibitively expensive 
On top of that, fiber takes a lot of time, sometimes years, but a CN wave network making use of existing infrastructure, such as power poles in the community can be turned up in a matter of weeks. So here I'm showing an example of a small segment of a network and CN wave allows for all these endless deployment options and a huge amount of flexibility. And as long as the DNs are within range of each other and with clear line of sight, networks can be created and we can design networks densely or sparsely depending on the overall demand and number of residents. The network operator has full visibility into the network for real-time monitoring to ensure uninterrupted service to the subscribers. And the monitoring and management capability is critical and Cambium has developed the software tools needed for the Network Operations Center or NOC to easily manage the network and pinpoint problems if they crop up. And the management software is an integral part of Cambium's overall CN Wave solution. Sorry about that, John. We had a little bit of okay. <laughs> technical glitch there, but I think you're back. All right, you got it back. Thank you. Uh, also, it's really easy to. Can everyone see the slides? Just because I I did get some texts from some people, they're not seeing the slides. Uh, I see the slide back. Oh, we're it's, getting lots of we're getting lots of thumbs up here. So yeah. Okay. Sorry about that glitch. Um, so it's also easy to expand these networks uh, because we can just add more not add more nodes, add more hops. And um, OK, now we'll just go ahead and advance. So oh, I need to take control. Advance, there we go. I think we're back in sync here. Uh, so this slide just shows some of the various devices in the platform, including the distribution node on the left and the four models of client nodes. Uh, I also want to mention that the system is secure. Uh, as it relates to keeping the system up and running, safe from hackers, hackers as well as end users' data and privacy. Okay, so even though this technology has only been around a couple of years, uh, the networks, CN Wave networks, are literally popping up everywhere. Uh, the photo on the left is taken in downtown San Jose, California in the heart of Silicon Valley, where the city of San Jose deployed a large mesh network throughout the entire downtown corridor. And in this case, the network is used as a backbone for free public Wi-Fi throughout the city center. And the CN Wave DNs are mounted on street lights and traffic lights along with the outdoor Wi-Fi access points, making uh, Wi-Fi, public Wi-Fi access available for all. Uh, the second photo is from a network in the UK where the CN Wave network is used for connectivity for a network of CCT, CCTV cameras and traffic sensors throughout the area. And I want to mention this because a CN Wave network deployed in your town can serve multiple purposes. It's not just for delivering broadband to homes and business. The same mesh infrastructure can be leveraged for residential broadband business connectivity, city offices, schools, uh, agriculture, as Caroline mentioned, as well as for public outdoor Wi-Fi, smart city devices, cameras, sensors, uh, all sorts of applications. And the images on the right show typical installations of DNs on poles, as well as a couple of client nodes on short uh, rooftop masts on homes. And those client nodes can be uh, mounted directly to, to walls or on the fascia as well. So I'd like to take just a couple minutes to compare CN Wave to traditional fiber, uh, traditional fiber of the home network. So fiber is great, uh, but it requires a lot of time and a lot of money because of the tremendous amount of equipment, construction, labor, uh, because of the hundreds of splice points, cabinets, enclosures, digging, trenching, specialized equipment. Also, the process is disruptive and fraught with delays, permitting challenges, and of course, high cost. 
a C and wave network when deployed on power distribution poles and city owned assets like street lights is far less expensive and with proper planning can be deployed very quickly. Uh, for the networks I've been involved with, which is many, we've seen the cost of C and wave being as low as one tenth the price of a fiber network. Uh, but the average is closer to about 0.2 or 20% of the cost of fiber. And I have here a, uh, a real world example uh, from one of my customers, one of Cambium customers in New Mexico. This is a traditional telephone company. It operates a hybrid fiber traditional copper DSL network. And the challenge for landline operators like TELUS in, in, um, in Canada is the existing copper in the ground is, is old, it's aging. Uh, it doesn't really support modern or, you know, broadband speeds that, you know, we need today. And the fiber network is spotty. It's only for transport. It doesn't go all the way to the homes. And so this is very, very typical in small rural neighborhoods where the existing copper is just not adequate and the fiber doesn't go everywhere. And in, in this example, the blue lines show where the existing fiber route is and the oranges of the copper. And this tel telephone company determined that fiber to the home cost for this small area, uh, which is only like 30 buildings, uh, would be something in the neighborhood of $150,000. It's a very small area, but very high cost. And then the solution was here, very simple CN wave wireless ring of four strategically located poles and in this case, the poles didn't even have power, so they installed solar panels and batteries on each of the pole poles to power up the um, C and wave distribution nodes. And the cost for this approach was only about $15,000, and it could be deployed in a matter of days. So it's a huge difference in terms of cost and time to deploy. And there's another aspect about fiber that makes it very, very expensive is that when building a fiber network, it must be deployed in a way that provides for coverage and connectivity to 100% of the homes, even if those homes and those subscribers don't end up being subscribers on the network. And it's a lot of added cost that can be avoided with wireless CN Wave because CN Wave gives a lot more flexibility because each distribution node can handle as many as 30 subscribers or as few as just one or two. Um, so a speedy deployment, cost-effective deployment of CN Wave still requires a lot of detailed planning. And that's an area where Cambium helps out uh, our partners like Connect Mobility and uh, we have a lot of tools to to help in this process. So the um, design process is, is really critical. Every project starts out with a simple analysis of the target area uh, that's going to be covered. We determine the number of subscribers, the take rates, the speed packages. Uh, we also determine how and where the network will be connected to the internet, uh, to the existing fiber, and the internet connection to the fiber can be direct to fiber or over wireless point to point connections. And we usually use a combination of both. And also we determine where are the optimal locations for the distribution nodes. And in the ideal environment, the operator, uh, and in this case it's true, right? Working with Fortis, the operator has access to what we call street furniture. Uh, street furniture are the street lights, the power poles, the traffic lights, and these assets are really ideal because they're close to each other. Uh, they all have power. Uh, they're tall enough to get the DNs over the obstructions. And that's really important because CN Wave uses millimeter wave frequencies, 60 gigahertz specifically. So line of sight between all the nodes is really critical. And we can use our design tools to optimize the network layout and at that stage, we have a pretty good estimate of the project cost. 
and the um, CapEx required to deploy. Uh, so how do we do this? Uh, we have, thanks to Cambium's engineering team, we have some great tools at our fingertips. And we work with our partners like Connect Mobility, and we use various tools like Link Planner software. And oftentimes we can design these uh, simple networks. We can design simple networks very, very quickly because designing a mesh network is really about finding the best way to simply connect the dots. And uh, Link Planner software makes that process pretty quick. And then for larger networks and for areas with lots of obstructions, we'll use additional tools like our advanced network planner, AMP, and that speeds up the design process and uses high resolution LIDAR data and automation to come up with network designs. But even with all these sophisticated design tools, it's still necessary to get boots on the ground on site in every project because even with these really great tools, the best tools in the world, uh, these tools don't have a 100% accurate view of the current community because trees grow, buildings get built, RVs get parked in front of power poles, and these obstructions uh, can only really be seen in person. So we call this a site survey, and it's a super important part of any project. Uh, these screenshots are some of, uh, from some of our design tools, and the map on the right is the beginning of a new network uh, that's coming online in Sedgwick. That's another Connect Mobility project. And the original design for Sedgwick was very close to what we see here, but minor modifications were made as a result of the site survey. And kind of wrapping up here, and I don't want to steal Merle and Yvette's thunder, but I wanted to give a sneak preview of a real world sand wave community in Alberta, uh, the Village of Standard. And Merle's going to tell us the story of Standard, which is really interesting. Uh, because this was one of our first community projects working with Connect and Fortis Alberta. So we're very proud of this. Uh, in fact, we published a uh, case study. You can find that on the Cambium website. But Standard is really interesting because it's a typical rural Alberta town. And this network and standard can be replicated across the province. And this particular project, the scope is about 38 um, distribution nodes, DNs on the poles, and that provides coverage for all the residents. And now the residents enjoy gigabit speeds. And it's just such a huge improvement from, um, from what they had before. And every project is different. And this one, um, and every project is different, but this one was very quickly deployed. It only took 21 days from start to finish. So just to kind of wrap up my portion, um, I wanted to just highlight that this opportunity uh, right now is really exciting for communities in Alberta specifically. And the reason is never before has it been possible to deploy such a reliable gigabit network so quickly and at such low cost. And Fortis, Alberta specifically, is demonstrating great vision and commitment to enabling true broadband because of their cooperation and allowing access to their very valuable assets, the distribution poles. Uh, and I can tell you that from my experience, at least so far, most power utilities uh, in the United States and even some in Canada so far have not been so easy to work with. Uh, they kind of remain reluctant. Maybe they don't know about the technology. So we do have some work to do on that. But fortunately, within Fortis uh, coverage territory, uh, the good people at Fortis really see the, the vision and they're making this a reality. So what makes it all possible today, whereas it wasn't in the past, uh, it's these cri three critical elements which have all come together. It's, it's Cambium Sandwave Wireless Mesh Technology, which is new. Uh, it's really transformative. Uh, it didn't exist uh, up until a couple years ago. 
And it's the vision of Connect Mobility, specifically uh, Merle Isaacson, who we're going to hear from later, who realized the potential and cleared lots of hurdles to start building and operating these networks. And it is Fortis Alberta, who embraced the idea and is making this all possible by granting access to the distribution pole, poles and streamlining the whole process to roll out these networks quickly. So that wraps it up for my part. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to turn it over to Ken and Jack from Fortis to talk about F what Fortis Alberta is doing to help communities with broadband connectivity. Awesome. Thank you so much, John. It, you know, it's so easy to echo your sentiments regarding, you know, access to reliable internet isn't just about entertain entertainment anymore. With so much business and education occurring from within the home now, it, it's easy to consider internet an essential service. Um, you know, the ability to earn an income and, and gain an education. So thank you very much for that. Um, as John mentioned, now we are joined by two Fortis Alberta representatives, uh, Ken Davis and Jack Tao. Uh, Ken is a utility services manager with Fortis Alberta, and I'm not sure if he'll be happy that I tell everyone that he's been in the electrical utility industry for 39 years, but he has been. Um, and Jack is joining us with his eight years of experience as well. So take it away, gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. Uh, so good morning, everyone. So just want to start off by saying so at Fortis Alberta, we do understand the need for broadband, as John has mentioned, and, and we want to be part of the solution. So with the technology that John has discussed, we have assets that can be utilized to help bring, bring broadband to areas within our service territory. We have worked with many vendors and we played a key role in successfully connecting wireless devices to our poles. Uh, we look forward to working with many of you as we support opportunities in your area. So as this slide shows, we have a process that can be quickly initiated and delivered. Uh, it'll allow for quick connection to our assets as well as to the grid. So for wireless attachment projects, uh, as the workflow shows, we review the vendor application. Um, we create a quote. We send the quote out once it's accepted, then it goes off to Fortis Alberta construction. So a very streamlined process. And then highlighted in the middle of the flow chart is John had mentioned that uh, boots on the ground field check. Uh, we found it very valuable in working with the vendors to just get out in front of the project. And uh, that early site visit, it, it identifies polls for the vendors when they are developing their mesh network design. So very important for the planning process and very cost effective. So as we know, uh, costs are very important for all projects. This uh, type of project that we're discussing today does have four to Alberta costs and fees. So we'll just go over them really at a high level today. So the, the four to Alberta construction costs, there are work or there is work that we have to do on our poles to get them ready for the attachments. So that is the Fortis Alberta construction costs. It varies with every project. Uh, there are some application fees for us to review and process the application. There is a annual licensed occupancy fee. So in order for us to have uh, attachers on our poles, we do need a licensed occupancy agreement. It's just, it's a contract that uh, helps everybody understand clearly what has to happen to attach to our poles. And uh, we do have like a, a rental fee for space on our poles that's charged out annually. And then the last cost that uh, Fortis Alberta side of it is, is the uh, monthly Fortis Alberta rate 41D. So that's for the power connection to the grid. As John had stated, these devices do need power. And so, Jack will follow up here with uh, some more information on the rate 41D and then the opportunities that this rate uh, allows for this type of a project. So I'll turn it over to you, Jack. Hey, thank, thank you, Ken. Ken. Right there, there's a little bit of echo there from the speaker. Yeah. 
So thank you, Ken. Uh, following Ken's comment there, uh, I'll explain a little bit further of the changes that Read 41D brings to your monthly bills for attaching small connected devices to 40 South Borders distribution facilities. So before year 2020, when a customer requires a small devices to be connected to the distribution system, for example, either being a wireless broadband devices, uh, security cameras, cable TV booster stations, uh, it typically is categorized as a small general service, which falls under 40 South Borders Rate 41. So Rate 41 has a minimum monthly distribution charge based on a minimum load demand of three kilowatts. Uh, if you are connecting your device before year 2020, uh, and if your device only consumes, let's say, a power of 100 watts, uh, it will still be charged based on the minimum demand of 3 kilowatts. And the device would also have been charged on a site-by-site -site basis, which means each device would have its own site ID, uh, its own retail administrative charge, and uh, its own distribution charge. So if you have multiple devices under separate bills, the power bill could go up really, really fast. Um, so for this, our board recognized that gap for allowing customer connect small devices. So in Fortis Our Borders 2020 annual distribution rate filing, uh, the company propi proposed a new rate 41D uh, that aims to help small connected devices, such as wireless broadband devices, to be connected to the distribution system in a more cost effective manner. So rate 41D allows new customer owned and installed small devices to be connected under 40 South Borders existing facilities and be aggregated for billing purposes. So if customers' small connected devices fit in 40 South Borders read 41D eligibility criteria, then customer could connect multiple devices of the same type and uh, would only need to pay one power bill, which means one administrative retailer's charge and one distribution charge based on aggregated demand and consumption from all devices. So this could help customers to reduce their monthly power bills significantly. So this slide gives further details of what are the requirements to qualify for the aggregation of services and what could be considered as a read 41 d service. Uh, this is applicable to not only wireless broadband devices, but also any other type of small devices subject to review by 40 South Border. So the criteria includes the following. Um, first is all eligible devices must be within the single municipal boundary. And uh, all devices must be of the same type. For example, you can't mix wireless broadband devices and security cameras under one side ID and categorize them as one single read 41D service. And uh, the consumption of the device should be small and stable. Um, devices must be attached to 40 South Borders facilities. And uh, if you want to add additional devices to your to a read 41 d side ID, um, that is an option as well. So these two slides are really high level summarized 40 South Borders read 41 d and the opportunity it brings to the wireless broadband space. Uh, following this webinar, if you have any questions which related to small connected devices, connection process and cost and monthly fees, uh, for this award is waiting to have the arrangement with communities um, to work with you on wireless broadband initiatives or any other initiatives that involve small connected devices. And please feel free to reach out to your stakeholder relationship manager and to obtain additional information that could help you make your decision. Now back to you, Jen. I would say that the Fortis guys got to have the, the good part of the presentation. Here's the, the smaller one. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you, Ken and Jack, very much for your time. Our caboose of the agenda today uh, is Merle Isaacson from Connect Mobility. Uh, Merle started working with telecom in 1990 and has been providing wireless communication in Alberta for over 32 years. Uh, he started Connect Mobility in 2018 with his partner, Brent Grisdale. The partners have a heart for rural Canada and have a current U and have current UBF funded projects happening in both Alberta and Ontario. Uh, and Merle is joined by special guest Yvette at April, the current CAO of the Village of Standard, who is front and center for the Village's wireless broadband implementation. So uh, take us away and finish this off strong, you guys. 
Thank you so much. I uh, really appreciate this opportunity with um, uh, Fortis Alberta to allow us to do this. Um, I don't see the ability to go through the slides here yet. Ah, there it is. Thank you so much. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, when uh, Carolyn was talking about um, um, about uh, changes with um, um, uh, within communities and values, uh, when we were setting up Sedgwick, we had a realtor come up to us and. The first thing she said is the uh, the very first thing people ask about when they're buying a house nowadays is does the house have internet, um, which certainly something I'd be looking for as well. So um, we uh, we started in the village of Standard um, in I think it was January of 2021, and we started the process of applying for the Universal Broadband Fund on their behalf. Um, we found out a short time after that the Village of Standard was not awarded the funding. And, um, and then we had to figure out a new way to build the community without uh, federal funds. Um, just in case anybody is unaware of, the, um, of what the Universal Broadband Fund is. Um, one sec here. The Universal Broadband Fund started, I believe, in November of um, 2020. Uh, and they had two programs. One was called the Rapid Response that had to be submitted by January. And the second part of the program was um, had to be completed by March of uh, 2021. Uh, the fund was $2 billion uh, on the a large part of the program. And I think the first part of the program was around $75 million. Um, when you applied for UBF funding uh, under uh, rural projects, they provided 75% of the capital and the community had to kick in the other 25%. Um, in March of uh, 2022, the uh, Alberta government kicked in around $780 million. And recently, uh, the Alberta and the federal government are launching new programs right now uh, that are, I don't believe as of today are even public uh, on the date when you can apply. But new money is going to become available here shortly. Um, I think the Alberta project, don't quote me exactly on this, but I believe it was around $34 million. And on the federal side, it was about another $500 million. Um, and as mentioned before, Connect has applied for uh, UBF funding for seven communities. Um, to date, we've won four of the seven. And um, the standard project was rejected but we do have an opportunity to go back and reapply again. And uh, we are definitely going to uh, give that a shot. When we first started working with um, the Village of Standard, the uh, thing that Yvette brought up to me immediately was that uh, they had had numerous uh, uh, providers in their community dating back 15 years, and they kept getting bought out by new companies. Um, the issue was though that every time they didn't get, they got bought out, um, they felt like they were more forgotten each time over and services didn't improve. Um, what we found when we started first started looking at the market, um, internet speeds throughout the community were 25 down and 10 up, um, but, Every evening, the data's got so slow as everybody got home that uh, streaming services pretty much uh, stopped completely. Uh, you couldn't sign into something like a like a, a Netflix or a program like that. Um, the other uh, issue that we're finding uh, and we're hearing about even today from um, from residents is they're getting billed up to two hundred dollars plus to uh, have a, a service tech come out and see them. And there were times that uh, up to two weeks before someone would come and help them out. Um, in some cases, people were said they were ordering larger data plans, uh, but even with the larger, larger data plans, the data speeds didn't increase. Standards uh, Council wanted to be part of a long-term planning and have more control of the internet services that were operating in the community. 
when I first started talking to them, they had a list of items that they wanted to cover off. And uh, a couple of them are really key. And it's uh, like the point I just made on the past slide, when we start talking about data speeds and them getting slower as you add more people on, Standard's biggest two concerns were uh, having consistent pricing for their, for their residents and having data speeds that didn't fade away when, every, when uh, everyone started uh, getting home at night. Um, people were buying, uh, <laughs> I get this every single time I go into a house, the first thing people do when they, uh, when they start talking to us is they start jumping on and doing speed tests. And as soon as we turn on an, an, an antenna in any home, everybody jumps on their phone and starts doing speed tests all over the place. Um, it's really quite comical, um, but uh, with, uh, with standard, they, uh, they thought it was key that uh, they, they had, whatever the people were buying in the community, that's what they got. Um, standard also wanted a local installation person so uh, their, their residents weren't waiting so long to get services. And uh, as well, and as Carolyn spoke about, standard wanted revenues uh, sharing to offset their investment. Yvette April is on the call here with us, and um, she is the CEO in the Village of Standard, and uh, she's going to come on now and share their experience um, with uh, our partnership. Yeah, yeah. Good, good. Oh, I got an echo here. Um, I'm so pleased to be here and uh, to inform you guys of the wireless broadband solution that we built for the Village. Um, I was very lucky. Our past and present council uh, recognized the importance of having the fast, reliable and affordable internet in the village. Um, like Merle said, every year we saw the internet service providers getting worse and not even meeting the requirements of the 5010. Um, we had been researching internet options for a few years and yes, the best option is the fiber to every home and business, but that was not going to happen here in the village. It's something we could not afford. We saw the presentation on the Town of Vermillion's pilot project to get internet to their industrial park. So we called and we inquired and here we are today with a design that's a fraction of the cost of fiber and built in a fraction of the time. Council used their funds from the Wheatland County Village Infrastructure Funding, and we partnered with Mobility and Fortis to build fast, affordable internet, which is available to all the residents and businesses, not just some of them. They're all got access to the internet. And some of the rural residents that have line of sight also have access. So Standard now has a say on how the service is being provided which is what we wanted, and is part of the promoting the service. So I'm positive that with Ford is providing access to their polls like they did in this situation, that an affordable wireless broadband solution can be designed for your municipality. I'm also very excited that we are working on a phase two where Standard will install equipment to expand further into our rural area, which once done, my home will also have access to the same internet. Um, we are planning on phase three, which will be to expand and provide the same service to our new industrial park when it gets completed next year. Um, um, thanks for attending this webinar, and I hope that uh, what we've provided here can help some of you with getting access to better internet in your municipality. Thanks and have a great day. Back to you, Merle. Thanks a lot, Yvette. Um, I just have to brag about Yvette here for a minute. Um, when we first started working with her, um, her passion for getting a good quality internet for the community uh, was amazing. Um, she had uh, a couple of ladies working with her in the office and uh, her team has just been excellent to deal with. Um, before we even started, uh, they had a list of 50 people that wanted to go on the internet service. And um, even to this day, um, they, they make phone calls to people. Uh, they've uh, put information on their Facebook page uh, that shows the rates um, of what we're doing. They have signs up at the front uh, of, the, uh, of the town office talking about the internet. Um, uh, Yvette made sure that uh, all of the um, town 
buildings are now on internet service. Um, and um, right now the curling rink, the arena, fire hall, town office, town shop, community hall, senior center, and the campground uh, was also set up with Wi-Fi uh, running off of one of our access points, uh, one of the um, uh, V5000s. Um, we just got the arena set up with Live Barn. And uh, for those of you that aren't familiar with Live Barn, um, it is a streaming service that streams hockey from the rink. Uh, so anyone that can't make it into town can watch the kids play. So um, uh, yeah, hands are, my hat's off to you that you're amazing and, and how you've uh, helped us. Um, so As John was talking about, the first step when you're designing a network is uh, to complete a leak plan and um, uh, using their software. Uh, I use uh, three computer screens when we do a design. We have um, uh, Google Maps operating on a couple of the, uh, of the other screens and we uh, link planner is the key. Um, once link planner is, is designed on paper, um, as exactly as, as John said, you have to go out and uh, get on the street and see exactly what uh, may be in the way. Um, when you build a mesh network, you can't have a tree in the way. It has to be clear line of sight at all times or that link will go down. Um, the uh, perfect design of a system we found is 150 meters apart. And uh, um, the only possible feasible way to make that, make that work is to go on, uh, on poles. So uh, first thing we did was we contacted Fortis Alberta um, I was fortunate enough to uh, get Ken on the phone and uh, he informed us that Fortis Alberta were taking an active role in supporting their customers with internet service on their poles. Uh, we met up with Fortis in Standard and we walked the village with uh, Ken and uh, a member of uh, the Standard Town Council joined us as well. So we knew exactly what we were doing and where we were going. Uh, and um, we, we were able to select all of the poles in about an hour and a half. So we had a, a basic design. Uh, we marked all of the poles and um, uh, one of the Fortis designers uh, took it back and uh, plotted it all out. Um, Fortis sent us a, um, a document showing all of the poles. We went back and forth a few times with them and we had the design done. Um, after Fortis installed the power, uh, Connect installed the, uh, the CN wave equipment on the 35 poles and we used two existing standard towers uh, as well. Uh, and I think this, we, we actually built another system at the same time um, that was a, um, we put on the tower uh, for doing some of the rural areas, uh, like close by to town, but uh, we built the whole system in three weeks. So uh, it's a very fast deployment. Um, uh, we we're, were able to do testing in town using a specific type of router. So we went to the furthest points that we could within the town and uh, we are we are delivering a thousand megabits per second everywhere in the community at the, at, and at the very furthest points. Um, as John had mentioned, uh, there is an auxiliary port in the bottom of the um, of the of every single distribution node. Um, actually, Yvette and I were just having a conversation about putting security cameras in and uh, covering off all the entrances into town and uh, using security cameras that are good enough to be able to read the license plates of people coming in and out of town. Um, some other devices we can throw on is uh, IoT connections that uh, read meters, lights, uh, manage pumps. Um, we can also add Wi-Fi on uh, any access point. So if you wanted to have Wi-Fi in a park or in a, in a, on a downtown street, uh, that can be added as well. Uh, and another service we offer is VoIP phones for business. And uh, we're just uh, getting that launched now in standard. Um, so the, uh, the connect network is, is attached to uh, Bell Axia Fiber in standard. Uh, we connect to fi the network to Fiber. Um, and um, the great part about working with Fiber and uh, working with uh, Bell Axia or with the SuperNet is it uh, can be upgraded at any time with one week's notice. So we can monitor our network. We know exactly how much data is being used at every minute of the day. Uh, we know all the peak times and we know exactly when to add more fiber onto the system. Um, 
when when we put a system in and because we're operating on on fiber it's symmetrical so it's the up and the download speed are the same so when someone buys a 50 down 50 up plan uh it stays at that speed uh 24 hours a day 100 up 100 down it really doesn't matter which plan uh, a person selects We, uh, we went through a lot of contract time with Standard to make sure that uh, we um, satisfied all of the requirements that they wanted. Um, and in the end, we were able to uh, provide them consistent data speeds, fixed internet service pricing. Uh, the way we can do fixed internet service pricing is, uh, is our prices are fixed from uh, the uh, fiber provider. So we know what our costs are at five-year increments. Um, revenue sharing is um, has been set up with with standard and we have set up local installation um, connect trains the local technicians and our engineers support them remote remotely if they need help on a job so how do we do all of this uh, connect invest capital into the town to build the network connect manages the billing software through our customer online portable portal uh, we set up credit card debit auto pay and eft online uh, Connect does all the scheduling for the installations and we receive all trouble calls and invoicing concerns. Um, we understand that the that internet requirements are different in every town that we work with. Um, some communities require building an entire town while others only require service for a new residential area or, or even just an industrial park. Uh, Fortis Connect Cambium and Cambium can help with any size of service required in rural markets. Uh, we want to thank Fortis for their willingness to support rural communities with internet services. Um, I'm cu currently working in th with three other um, utility providers and uh, we do not get this type of, uh, of reception at all. And in some cases, we can't even get a call back. So, Connect wants to thank Fortis and the Village of Standard for giving us this opportunity to share our vision with you. Um, in closing, the UBF and the Alberta government are re releasing new rounds of funding very soon. If you need help with applying for funding or wondering if you qualify, please contact us and we can help you through the application process. If the eligibility map says that you do not qualify, but you know your community has poor internet service, you can still apply by proving that you do have that, that you do not have the mandated 5010 requirements for UBF. Um, Connect would appreciate the opportunity to meet with your concern to discuss how we can help uh, work together. So thank you again. Thank you thank very you much, very Maral. Much. And thank you very much for all of the panel participants today. That was a lot of information. Hopefully we didn't lose anyone along the way. Um, I am going to open microphones and cameras now. Uh, if anyone does want to be on camera or ask a question verbally, uh, we did have questions coming in during the presentation. Thank you for everyone who participated in the Q&A via the chat. Uh, some answers have already been posted there by our panel participants, but we will review them as a group. Um, also as well, uh, we are going to leave um, questions open. If we do not get to it, time doesn't permit, we can't get to you uh, before the end of the session today. If you have any questions for any of our panel participants, you can email them to licensedoccupancy at fortisalberta.com. Uh, we will ask that you do that no later than this Friday. And then by December, Ninth, we will have a copy of the presentation sent out to you um, along with the written uh, version of the Q&A. So if you were interested in any of those questions, you could do so. Uh, so that being said, I am just going to make it so that uh, everyone can now participate. It was not that we didn't want to hear your wonderful voices or see your smiling faces throughout the presentation, but of course, uh, unfortunately, sometimes uh, barking dogs, background conversations can get in the way. So thank you for letting us mute you during this period of time. Um, I will get started. I do see that I have a hand up. 
Uh, and so we will get with that. And that is from uh, Mr. Ed Moore. So Ed, if you wanted to join us with the mic off and let us know your question and we can see which one of the panel participants uh, can answer it for you. Or no? Hi, can okay. you hear me? Yes, oh, we can hear you now. It's always nice when you press the right button. Anyway, <laughs> I'm a town councillor for the town of Edson, and uh, I just wondered, um, uh, have you had uh, cases of nefarious people trying to shoot out modes anywhere in the province? Interesting. So I believe that that would be a, a Merle John um, question to field. Do either one of you want to uh, take that one? Damage to your equipment? We've not experienced that yet. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Let's hope it continues. <laughs> awesome. OK, um, I do have a, a hand up from uh, Mario. I'm sorry, no last name. Um, Mario? Yeah, hi, I, I'm uh, Mayor of Ball. Uh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, I, I've worked with the 60 gigahertz and, and um, I, and I'm, I'm also an ISP provider. Um, my concern would be weather. Um, what, what, with the snow and the rain, um, how does, how does the wave um, work? Do you have a fallback, or do you have um, um, anything that's that I know there's another company out there that does have a five uh, gigahertz fallback. Um, do you guys have that with the Cambium gear? Perfect. I'll, I'll, and this uh, is great. Thank you very much for the question. We did also yeah. have a, a similar question in the Q&A, so I'll just address it at the same time. Uh, and then, John, you can field it because I believe that you did get to this question here. But uh, uh, sentiments uh, are the same. You know, if sightline is required, what is the impact of weather, heavy snowfall, winds, uh, and can high speed still be delivered during the times of peak usage? So, John, I'll turn that one over to you. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, it's the right question. Um, it's, it's interesting you have experience in the internet business. So, you know, you know this is something we need to design for. Uh, Merle had a really good point. Um, that is the optimal spacing between devices, meaning the uh, distribution nodes or distribution node to client node, about 150 meters. It's a pretty short distance. 60, 60 gigahertz is millimeter wave. It doesn't transmit very far. It's very low power, no obstructions. We're designing the network for reliability in weather. So uh, snow is a factor, rain is a bigger factor, but when we design a network with the proximity between devices at, at that short range, 150 meters, that's taking into account the expected rainfall, the rainfall rate in terms of millimeter uh, millimeters of rain per hour, so that the network will stay up. So rain is not a problem, snow is not a problem, wind is not a problem as long as things are, you know, secured. Um, heat, uh, these are deployed in the hottest places around the world, the coldest places, uh, northern Alberta. Uh, it, you know, this has been out for a couple of years. We don't really have issues with hot, cold, um, some of the bigger dishes uh, have, uh, you know, we've, we've experienced problems where the longer range dishes can accumulate snow and ice, but we've come out with a solution for that, which is a radome. Um, so, you know, in short, a properly designed network uh, should not be affected by weather. Now, if any single point to point connection goes down between nodes, this is where the mesh topology and the routing comes in. Say we have a, a, a link in the mesh that goes down for whatever reason, obstruction, super heavy unexpected rain, the traffic and the packets will route the other way. And that's part of the resilience of the CN Wave platform and what it's designed to do. So it's designed to work in weather.
Awesome. Thank you, John. Um, OK, so we will move into uh, some of our written questions that we do have here. Again, some have been able to be addressed in the Q&A by the panel participants. Uh, if again, we do not get to you, uh, we will have these all written out and distributed uh, when the uh, copy of the presentation goes out. Uh, question for Ken and uh, Jack. Uh, from Fortis, Alberta, would municipalities be required to have contracts with power companies to use their existing power poles? So Ken uh, mm -hmm. was able to address this, but I think it is a good question uh, for the group. So uh, Ken, if you wanted to just, I guess, reiterate the sentiments that you added to the chat here. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, Jennifer. Uh, so the owner of the device that's being attached to the pole would have to enter into a licensed occupancy agreement with Fortis Alberta. So if the municipality is the owner of the, the device, then yes, we would have a, uh, an LOA as we refer to it with the municipality, but it could also be with the, uh, the vendor, the communication company, if they are the owner of, of that device. Awesome, thank you. Uh, Carolyn, I haven't gotten to see your smiling face in a little bit, so I'm going to pick on you. Uh, we have a question here from um, Stephen Novak that says, what were the costs incurred by Vermilion to move forward with the wireless project, if you are able to share that information? Um, absolutely. Uh, some of our challenges, um, and I did allude to that, was we were not able to um, use the existing poles. So we actually had to buy telephone poles, which was, um, that's why this, honestly, this opportunity um, just seems so much more right. Um, we also um, then uh, linked with a number of our current uh, businesses in the community. So we have, and it's probably very traditional to most communities, uh, huge grain elevators sitting right on the track in the central part of town. And so we, it was, it's privately owned. We approached the business there and asked if we could put our receivers on there because it gave us a higher line of sight. Um, and so we were able to then, yeah, get, just get better, better lines of sight. And as a result, any business that participated with us, we gave them either a discount or free internet. Um, a very interesting story because at the time the, 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 individual who owned the elevators along the track he was like well it doesn't really matter okay I'll take it his son was like okay dad you do not know how much this is going to change our life and yeah they they totally just didn't appreciate the work that they could do once they had access so it was it was more so for that um, I think the other piece that was expensive and that's why I think it's so great that Merle um, is coordinating the UBF and all of that was we we actually had to hook up to um, the fiber provider, which was a significant cost for us. So uh, once we got that uh, connection to our devices, then it was just a straight cost. I hope that answers your question. I don't know, Merle, if you want to add anything to that. No, I think you did a great job there, Carolyn. Um, Yvette here, can I just add that Fortis, um, when we were doing our contract, they, they do offer, um, uh, not, not a payment plan, but uh, it's a basically a loan, right, that you pay off in, um, in a time frame. So is that correct, Ken? Uh, yeah, Yvette, there are some options uh, for sure with uh, municipal franchise agreement holders in Fortis Alberta Service Territory. And again, like I think Jack had mentioned, if, if there's any questions, you can reach out to your, your local SRM uh, to get in more of the details. That would have been ideal for us to have had a franchise agreement, and we tried to secure that with our, our um, energy provider, but that was not an opportunity. I think, too, we were probably one of the first out of the gate with this technology. So, you know, leaders always have to kind of shovel the path a little little bit more. So I think now there's a lot more opportunities to do that. Awesome. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to another uh, verbal question. Um, we'll get out of the Q&A here for a little bit. So I have a question hand up from uh, Mr. Gordon Reynolds. 
Yeah, just uh, for standard, you were talking about one gig service, uh, Merle, but I see on the standard website that they're offering um, uh, up to 150 up and 130 uh, no, 130 up and 150 down. What, uh, can you explain the difference there? Yeah, you bet, uh, Gordon. So the um, the way we set up the system is, is uh, we have the capability to deliver up to a gig or 1,000 megabits per second. Um, very seldom do we have anybody want to buy that much just because simply because of the cost. Uh, you may have the odd business that needs 500 megabits per second, uh, mm -hmm. But we have not found that yet in standard that anybody wants that large of a data plan. Okay. Um, we, we are working with a couple of other communities um, and it's, it's, it was asked actually Husky looking for, can we, can we get 500 megabits per second? Uh, but, you know, typically for a house, uh, people don't need anything faster than this. So for a business though, just, just ballpark, what, what would that plan cost? Maybe double um, what you're su suggesting here. Or? Yeah, you would you would be like four to five hundred dollars a month. Okay. If if you start getting up in those kind of data plans. Okay. I, you even uh, Gordon even normally when when somebody wants that big of a plan they don't use it very often. If you right. know what I mean, like you, you very seldom do you ever actually hit those those bursts. So we don't we don't have to increase the price that much, but. But at the same time, they could potentially use something that, uh, if they use it a lot, that uh, costs over $1,000 a month to buy. Yeah, we have businesses in our town that uh, have actually paid to access the uh, SuperNet uh, yep. that are, are paying like 2000 a month. It's, it's exactly. Crazy. It is crazy. Yep. Yeah, we hear lots of stories of people running fiber in just to get the fiber in they're paying over thirty to forty thousand dollars, and then paying a couple of grand a month on top of it to to for the service. Yeah. yeah. Okay, and even for us, they 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 had uh, we had some businesses quoted, you know, twenty grand just to dig the trench, and literally kitty corner from where the the thing was, kitty corner to where their business was, and that was uh, an implement dealer. So, um, yeah, and business unfortunately feels like they they need it, right? So. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to uh, round this up with one last question uh, from Christine Weiss. Ho hopefully I pronounced your last name properly. Um, and then we'll get into our next steps and wrap this up. Thank you. It's Wheezy, but that's okay. Everyone calls me Weiss. It's fine. Um, my question is, um, we're extremely interested of this for Westlock County. Um, my question is, um, in our area, um, as in probably most of rural Alberta, we have very poor um, cell service. Um, so would this somehow help out in those areas where we constantly have the dead zones? Like everyone knows where it is, where you're breaking up on the phone. Um, it's become a lot of a safety issue for our county residents, being that um, we just, we can't seem to supply a good grid that works for um, cell service. So would this be, or has anyone had any improvements on, on that for, for rural areas? Um, or is it just within this grid or is the grid expanded enough to, to support that? That's my question. I, I can take it, um, John, if you want to jump in as well. Um, yeah, we, we don't have any control over uh, where the telcos build. And uh, I, your question, I believe, is uh, is more of a telco question between uh, Telus and Rogers uh, building. Um, the only the only thing we can do, and as we mentioned before, we can actually add Wi-Fi wherever one of our systems systems are, and you could do a Wi-Fi call from that access point. So, that, you got anything else, John, that you can add to that? You're muted. No, I, I take that as a no. <laughs> I think uh, you know when when we uh, work with communities and design networks, we want to know about where those dead spots are and uh, expand the network accordingly to cover those dead spots. Yeah, yeah, you bet. Awesome, thank you. Very good questions. Thank you, everyone.